Martin, Yang and Zhao back for the first show of 2024. We're starting off with a bang tonight. Uh -oh. I've got a guest who needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him one anyways. The, he is the cleric of Canada, the high priest of Honeywood, the dungeon minister himself. Oh, hello. Ah, uh, thanks for joining me. Oh, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, and anyone uh, who hasn't, uh, subscribe to the channel. I'm like this close to hitting 500. It's not going to mean anything, but it's a nice psychological point. So <laughs> if you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe. Uh, so anyone who doesn't know, the Dungeon Minister has his own YouTube channel, link in the description, where he is often talking about Beck Me. Um, and why don't you tell everyone, what is Beck Me? Oh, Beck Me is an acronym. Uh, I see that Bill Sylvie's out there. He loves acronyms. Um, it <laughs> stands for Basic Expert Companion Master Immortal, and it's the uh, the box sets that came out beginning in 1983 that were later sort of coalesced into the Rules Cyclopedia. Um, it was a, a version of the BX system, essentially, that was specifically put together as a learning tool. So you'd get, you'd, you'd only get the bits that you could digest as you went along, as the game became more complex as the box sets came out and as you went up in levels. So when you got the basic set, the Dungeon Master's Guide only had monsters that low level characters could deal with and only gave out treasures that would be appropriate for low level characters. And, uh, but as you advanced, you know, the books became more complicated, the system became more complicated. Um, so by the time you got to things like weapons mastery and, and, you know, um, uh, you know, multiple attacks and all that kind of stuff, you've been playing for long enough that you could absorb these things easily. And it was, it was a very sort of gentle on-ramp for it. And someone gave me the book when I was a kid and, uh, and I, you know, did the, the opening adventure, which is famous for having Alina, the cleric and uh, her death at the hands of the, the dastardly Bargle, um, so I played that as a kid and ended up uh, being DM for a group of my friends and uh, stuck with it uh, for a while. And it vanished for a bit. And then my um, when my kids uh, were, uh, well, it was about three years ago now, they were asking, uh, two or three years ago, they were asking about Dungeons and Dragons. And so I explained it to them and I said, would you like to play it sometime? And I said, yeah, like, well, let's try that. So I, I ran a game thinking we'd play it maybe once, maybe twice, and they'd find out what D&D &D was and then it'd be over. And well, we've been playing it since. All three of them, you know, have now run games for each other and for me. And, you know, yeah, so it's become it's uh, become their primary hobby now. <laughs> so about uh, how old were they when you started playing with them? So it would have been... Uh, 11 and nine and six. Oh, 11, okay. Eight, actually 11, eight and six, because we started in the early, in the, in the late spring, early summer before our middle guys, Touchberry is the character he plays. Hope anyone who knows my channel knows him as Touchberry. Um, but bef just before his birthday, we started. So they okay. were young. They were young. Uh, and was there any problem with, uh, especially like the six year old was any problem having him keep up or. Uh, no, not keep up in terms of playing the game. He picked up that stuff very easily. I mean, the math involved is relatively simple, and he's mm -hmm. actually pretty bright in math anyway. Um, you know, it, it you'd have to... When you're going to write down... You know, when he's got to record what magic items he has, he needs help with that. He needed help with okay. that um, originally. Um, there, there were... Uh, whenever it's probably less about their age and more about the fact that they're siblings, there's egos involved. So if they have <laughs> a big battle and one of them, you know, really contributes a lot, takes the, the bad guy down a lot of hit points and another one doesn't the one who doesn't, you know, maybe doesn't score a big hit or, you know, they feel bad and which they probably wouldn't, but the fact that it's with their brothers. <laughs> so there's some ego involved and, and, and rivalry and all that kind of stuff. But as for in terms of there being kids, um, the big one is attention span uh, for the little guy. Originally, it's less so now. Again, he's older. 
Um, but attention span. And the other thing was dice going all over the place, ending up on the floor, <laughs> ending up under the refrigerator, ending up, you know, so that was one of the reasons I started making uh, dice towers was just to keep the dice on the bloody table. Um, so, you know, that's a, a pretty good split in age, you know, from six to 11. So mm. how do you, how do you sort of make a campaign that appeals to all of them? Did, did you do anything differently or um, you said, ah, sometimes we have to do this a little easier or. So, um, well, we were, chatting before we went live that mm -hmm. yeah the you don't do so much of the bar wench um or the the you know the female fighter in the chainmail bikini um that also is kept at a minimum because you know my wife is part of the game so <laughs> <laughs> not a good idea um but uh you know in terms of of a game that appeals to them all um part of it also because they're they're brothers. They've grown up together. Um, we also homeschool, so there there's less of a "I'm too cool to play with you" because you're you're younger, which really is a sort of thing that develops in school, right? Because you get grades, mm -hmm. and I'm in this grade. I'm not going to play with anyone in that grade. Um, and they're brothers, and so the 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 oldest, the eldest, uh, Fleetwood, he he can slide down and play in a zone that is comfortable for the little kids. Um, for the youngest, Bob Johnny, but Bob Johnny can also slide up and play things that are, you know, above his age group um, because they're used to doing that. But I would say in general, because I've also run a game uh, at the parish for, for kids in the parish, it opened it up a little wider. Um, you, you watch the themes. It's the same way that you, if you're going to show them a movie, you're, you know, you're, you're probably, you know, you're probably not going to be um, putting in Game of Thrones or, or um, yeah, you know, Rome or something. Um, but so you watch the themes more than anything. In terms of the complexity of the game, that's never an issue. Like the complexity of the game, kids can memorize every Star Wars character's name, every, you know, superhero and what their powers are and how their powers you know, interact with other powers from other characters. They know they're fine. They don't need any help with that kind of stuff. They can manage complexity that makes my head spin. Um, but it is really just thematic, mostly. Uh, you just keep away from the heavy gore. And there was one. There was one in game where there was um They were going into Bargle's Tower actually, and there was the uh, the voice of a of a crying child which was intended to lure them on. We have to save this child. And it worked, but it, it really kind of bugged Dutchberry. Like it, it, he didn't, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it's, it's, yeah, you just gotta be aware of the, of the, of the, the kids you're working with. And he was fine. It wasn't like he was traumatized for life or anything, but um, you just gotta be careful with the, with the tone and the, the subject matter of some stuff being aware that you're working with that range in, in ages. The mm -hmm. other thing I found is that, um, in terms of attention spans, when I was a kid, we never used miniatures ever, uh -huh. but with kids that age, especially when we started putting the minis down on the board, on the table, you know, and, and then starting to do terrain as well, dungeon tiles and whatnot really helped because there's a, there's a focus, right? And so when you've got, I think by the time we were using terrain, it was six to seven year old, the little guy. And he's kind of, you know, wandering. If you've got something on the board, it focuses a lot better. You know, now he, if we had started this year, I think we wouldn't have needed it. Um, but it's fun too, right? When you bring something new out and there, there's the wow factor and that's kind of cool. Uh, so, you know, speaking of other, uh, subjects that, uh, you don't want to get into too much, um, I don't like horny bards in, in adult games. <laughs> it just leads to all sorts of awkward moments at the table where now you've got some, you know, pot bellied 50 something guy trying to flirt with one of the players. Cause he's got to play the bartender, right? He's got to play the, the wench. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's true. It's just awkward. Yeah, I, I always do a fade to black at those moments and roll for VD after. Yeah, um, really. But but uh, I've heard a lot of people say that um, there shouldn't be any violence in uh, D&D games for kids. Like what's uh, you, you mentioned like no heavy gore, but like what's sort of the the sliding scale of OK violence? Um, well, first of all, I mean, I think. It's funny, just uh, for New Year's Eve, we put in a movie um, to watch mm -hmm. for, the, for the, the boys and they don't they don't watch a lot of movies and they haven't gotten into the whole, you know, superhero MCU, all of mm. that. And it's just not something they've ever gotten into. So what we put in, we put in the old, the, the old original Tobey Maguire Spider-Man movie, right? Oh, nice. And the, uh, the rating on it said it was PG for stylized violence. And that about captures it, right? Um, mm -hmm. At least when we started off, you know, they, they shot the kobolds with their bow and arrow. They, you know, cut the kobolds with their swords. We didn't go into, I, I didn't, I didn't lavish the description on the kind of wound the way I would have with an adult. Right. Um, so it's not full anime with blood spurting everywhere. Yeah. Now, as they've aged now, since, since then, like when we started, they hadn't watched the Lord of the Rings movies yet. Mm -hmm. Right. Because again, um, there's a six year old, you know? Uh, and even though the 11 year old would have been fine with it, uh, Fleetwood would have been fine with it back then. Bob Johnny was too young for it, but as they've aged, now they have watched those movies. They've watched things that have some um, degree of violence in it. That's in the Lord of the Rings movies. There's not, there's a lot of violence in terms of combat, but there's not a lot of viscera. You know, I think the, mm -hmm. the worst thing in terms of gore that I can think of is when um, Gandalf brings the, the Rohirrim down the side of the mountain, they plunge into the orcs and there's a, a, a sword swing and a head goes <laughs> spiraling up. That's probably the goriest thing I can think of that happens in those movies. Um, and it's pretty like off to the side and it's not the main thing happening on screen. So, um, in a, in a sense, you could say that that would be about you could, the Lord of the Rings movies level of violence is about where we're at now. Um, and, uh, and I do, I mean, I do go ahead, go into some descriptions of things of, um, uh, you know, in, in fighting monsters and things like that of, of, of what happens because you want to have a descriptive you know evocative engaging sort of thing happening um mm -hmm. if spider-man is less violent than the tom and jerry cartoon <laughs> definitely um uh but uh so you want you want to have you want to have some some good description so they they for instance they fought a, a skeleton giant and as they went down i mean there's um, bones littering the place you know and, and i actually did a little piece of terrain for it um and then we they fought saber claws and i decided that the way saber claws were invented i know there's something about it in the saber river module the old beck me module but i just invented my own idea of it that they were invented using the body parts of sentient creatures and mm -hmm. their blood you know and so when we started talking about it it, it was relatively you know descriptive gory in its description but partly there it wasn't happening at the moment it was something that had happened in the past so i was describing what had been done but they're also older now so they've kind of grown into being okay with with dealing with that kind of subject matter um i don't i just don't i don't lean into it i'm not doing sort of more board kind of you know uh, grotesquery hmm um so I'm wondering too, you know, you mentioned you sort of open up a parish game. I mm -hmm. assume there's more kids involved now. Um, yep. Has, have you ever been able to use D and D as sort of like a teaching moment or um, sort of like a moral guide? People might think that uh, the collar is just for YouTube cosplay, but no, you are an actual minister. Yeah. Yeah. It's It's an actual, I'm, I actually I'm a priest. Yeah. Um, well, you know what? One of the <laughs> relatively, I guess it was early on, uh, the parish game, 
they were going to investigate a, a, a cave that had been recently infested with goblins. They moved, they moved into the area and they infested this cave. And we we're going to go root them out. And the cave is in the vicinity of this little farming village. It's out, you know, one of the fields leads up into the foothills and it's somewhere in the foothills is where this cave is. So they go to the little village and they're just asking for information. And one of the kids decides he's going to attack the farm woman who comes to, to talk to them. He's just going to attack her. And, you know, the rest of the group was sort of like, yeah, okay. You know, they just wanted to play the game. And this kid was acting out and he's going to do a violence thing, you know, and he's going to be horrible, <laughs> really. Um, and so that, I try not to be the sort of pedantic teaching moment of now we shouldn't do these kinds of things, you know, because it's not right. But there's consequences in the game, right? Mm -hmm. There's consequences in the game. Now that particular that particular party never reformed after that. Just scheduling and because kids started doing soccer and gymnastics and blah, et cetera. So that that never came together again. But if it did, and if it does, there's going to be consequence. So when they come out of that goblin's cave, the town guard are going to be there, right? And they're going to arrest that kid, <laughs> that kid's character, and haul him off, right? And I imagine um, a very angry husband. A very angry husband. Um, and and he didn't actually ever, I don't think we ever, the other players didn't let him kill the woman in the game. They stopped him too. So I didn't have to play the pedant. Um, the group pulled him away from that and let him know that this is just not cool, dude. You know, that's not. That's not what we're doing. Um, in terms of my own uh, my own boys in the in the game, um, not as much in terms of morality because uh, they they have never. No, nah, that's not true. Touchberry plays on the chaotic side, and he actually had a his second character was a cleric, um, who was the most murderous cleric you could ever think of, bloodthirsty cleric. Um, but they don't, they don't tend to go in, in that, uh, direction, but there is so much to learn in terms of, well, in terms of, of ego control, right. You know, um, it's about accomplishing the goal, seeing it well done, appreciating what the other members of the group bring to the adventure, bring to the, you know, to, to solving the problems rather than I want to be the hero, I want to be the center of attention all the time. So there's there's that that learning in which I, I, I find that especially the old school games do so well to encourage a a broad teamwork that um, you know the magic user is you know pretty near helpless at low levels um, and so needs the others to keep him safe. Um, the thief is going to be, um, you know, weak and you know, her skills aren't going to be great at first, but we'll have skills that will balance that out, but they all have to be brought to bear as a team. And so there's a lot of learning to subsume one's own ego to the greater good of the, of the group, um, to, to get the job done and, and, but also to be proud of the things that you do bring, right? Um, instead of wanting to be everything, mm -hmm. um, being willing to do, I do this and I do this really well. This is my thing is my moment to shine and then doing that and, and not having to be the center of the thing all the time. Hmm. That, that has been, that's a, that's a, I think a neat thing about the games in general for kids or adults. <laughs> Yeah, um, a few years ago, I was actually reading um, some psychological studies where um, they they used fMRI machines to figure out what part of the brain is activated when you're playing role playing games. Really? And apparently um, the like you and I right now are using one part of our brain because we're interacting with each other. But people who are watching this later, not participating or when you watch TV or a movie, you're you remember it in a different part of your brain huh. um, and what they found is through role-playing games it's the same part of the brain as if you were really there 
And uh, I've always had the theory that, uh, well, I shouldn't say always, but since I read that, I've had the theory that, you know how you say like, oh, remember when we fought that dragon and we did this? Like, well, you didn't. You were sitting around a table and it was your characters who did it. But, you know, it could be physiologically you're because it's in that part of the brain. Maybe it happens Mm -hmm. to you. So I was kind of wondering, have you noticed any, um, how would you say, any development psychologically or or like emotionally or sort of uh that the kids uh whether your own or, or for the parish sort of went mm-hmm. through after they started playing I, I would and what i would say is um my eldest fleetwood is far more confident now hmm. um and that has to do with he, he has an astonishing capacity to absorb and retain and apply information so, um, <laughs> I, I tell, I've actually told this story a couple of times in the last few days. I don't know why it keeps coming up, but here it is again. I read, uh, recently read, um, uh, recently, like a year ago, I read, um, Dune, Frank Herbert's, you know, massive, mm-hmm. the first of the million and a half novels. Um, and it took me like a week, you know, to get through the thing, um, and one day I'm going on my way to work, right? And so uh, Fleetwood asks, "Yeah, can, can I read that? Is it, can I can I look at that?" And I thought about it. I was like, "There's nothing really terribly objectionable in there." And I think he was at the time he was 12. I was like, "Yeah, you could you could read that. Sure, here you go." So I went to work. I it was a long day. I will say this: it was a long day. But I got back from work that evening. He had read it. Wow. And I asked, so I thought, okay, there's no way he actually read it. He skimmed it. I said, so, okay, where did, where did Paul meet uh, Bertie Halleck after, after everything went down? Where did he meet him again? He knew, you know, uh, well, well, who was so-and-so who did this, who did that? He knew I'm like, okay, he actually read it and he gets a, he gets a rule system. So, um, uh, it was, um, I don't know what he calls himself now, but at the time it was DM James. I think he's still DM James. Um, gave us uh, Adventure Conqueror King. No, he gave us Conan. It was Squirrel Hermit gave us Adventure Conqueror King. And uh, Fleetwood picked up, you know, ACK and and read through it, grasped that it was essentially a BX clone, figured out its rule system really quickly, and was able to apply it right away. Uh, to the point where I was building a castle for a character in another campaign the other day. And he said, Oh, just use the cost tables that are in here. Boom, boom, boom. Here it is. And he's, he's a very good recall and a capacity to apply the things. So that, that has, um, I think that's been a confidence boost. Like hey, I can do this stuff. I can do this and I'm good at it. And he is too. He, he, he ran some games for Clericon, uh, the convention that I held back in November. And, uh, the people who played in it were like, that was a really cool game. You know, it's a 13 year old leading it. Right. But he's good at it. So that's been, that's been a, a big something. Um, and I, I think, I don't know because we, we didn't do it without playing role playing mm-hmm. games, but I think it has um, strengthened the boys uh, capacity to, to, work together on a project to to share out pieces of a thing and to Mm -hmm. to come together around one you know again i don't know we've never done raising them from you know six through eleven up to nine through thirteen we've never done that without role playing so i don't have a control but um they do they do have a good capacity to work together on a project and um I, I can only believe that it has helped having played role playing games and solved problems in that in that context. I can only I can only think that it must have helped them develop that that ability. Yeah, you know, it's been interesting for me. Uh, I haven't played with you know too many kids, but um, when I I used to play with a group at a gaming store, and we would see some younger players there. And um, one thing I noticed is uh, you know a lot of them who were kind of like shyer. For some yeah. reason, when they were playing a, a character, like it was easier to come out and 
you know, say things and be brash and bold. Whereas usually they they were kind of like little wallflowers. And then, you know, over the course of the year, you sort of see them pick up. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Touchberry, um, in, in his real life is, um, I mean, he's not, he's not shy, but I say he's probably of the three, the most sensitive of the boys. He's the one that gets the, if I read a book, you know, we do a bedtime story every night. And and if the story involves an animal dying, he's the Mm -hmm. one who, who gets upset by it. Like he was upset by the crying child and, but he plays Touchberry, who is just balls to the wall nuts. You know, I mean, burning things down and and charging right into the mouth of the dragon. You know, he he's 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 constantly the one who's you know the the, the monster is picking up and throwing or dropping or carrying off because he rushes in right where where angels fear to tread, and so that is a it's a different kind of of expression for him right Hmm. whereas whereas fleetwood as the eldest boy tends to be the one with the plan you know in real life he's the one who's the idea or if the other two are playing a game he'll come along and suggest a structure for it right so when we play fleetwood is the leader of the party he's the one who comes up with the ideas he's the one who who has the plan um so he, in that case, he's he's playing what is natural to him is coming forward. Whereas with Touchberry, it's more about a, a part of him that would like to be there as a chance to come out. You know, I, I hope it stays in the game because I don't want to come home to the house burned down. Sometime. <laughs> Save that for college. Yeah. Yeah. When I burn someone else's house down. Um, so, uh, I guess the last question I have on this topic uh, will will make some people angry. Um, so you're a Beckney guy at home, and I I know from yeah. talking to you before that you mentioned uh, at least one of your kids was playing uh, a five E session yeah. at uh, a local gaming store. Have you noticed any difference in um, the the different games uh, oh, yeah. for kids? Like, yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Well. Okay, so yeah, th- so uh, Fleetwood started playing at the, the the local game shop, the Hooded Goblin. I want to give them a, a a shout out. Not that I think maybe half a percent of the people watching this are anywhere near Georgetown, Ontario, but um, they're a great store. Um, he he went down there to start playing in a campaign, and and for a while I was just sitting there while he would play. I would because it's far enough that you don't want to drive there and back and there and back again to pick him up afterward. So I'd sit there um, and watching the gameplay. I mean, I think the I think it was the first session I sat there kind of overhearing. The party fought four adult or ancient blue dragons and and killed them all like in two rounds of combat. Wow. I was like, what? What? How is this a game? You know, Um, and as I've as I've followed you know through him him telling me about the play and also then he will dm his brothers in a 5e game here partly because i didn't want to give him the beck me dungeon master's guide because i wanted to keep some secrets <laughs> right <laughs> i didn't i didn't want him to know how many hit dice uh you know fill in the blank has so um listening to it it is a different game and i don't just mean it's a different edition of the game it is a different game it, the only things in common are the names of the ability scores. They're used entirely differently. Um, and I guess hit points is the same word, but the scale is completely different. I mean, it's a different t- game. And where I saw that come out at, I started running a game at the, at the game shop at the hooded goblin. And I've got a couple players who are old grognards. They've been playing since, you know, the eighties and, and, and they got, the game they used to play it. Then I've had some people who were 5e gamers who joined. And there's been mixed results there. One in particular, and this is not a slam on him at all. It's just about what you get used to. If you if you grow yeah. up speaking French, you will speak English with a French accent, right? And so he's playing Beckme with a 5e accent, which means there's a dark room. 
you can hear a scuttling, snapping sound echoing in the cavern beyond. You have two hit points. I'm going to go in. <laughs> Are you going in with everyone else? No, I'm just, just me. I'll go in. I'll go check it out, guys. I'll be right back. Like, you don't do that in an old school game. You know, you've got two hit points. You are nearly dead. Um, why would you do that, right? But in 5e, there's all of these saves. There's all of these outs that, that a character has. And 5e, I don't know if it's in the rules, because I, I haven't really dissected, looked at the rules, and thought about game theory and all this stuff. But in the way I see it played, certainly watching Fleetwood play it down at the, mm -hmm. at the Hooded Goblin, in the way I see it played, while old school games reward teamwork, tactics, caution, um, you know, a, a real a real tactical way of playing. You know, I have this strength, you have that strength. We'll combine them to do this, and we'll do it very cautiously. Exploration. 5e rewards bravado. If you can come up with something that sounds cool or funny or extreme the DM will generally let you do it because it'll make everyone at the table cheer and laugh and it'll be cool, you know? And again, it's two different games. I, I, yeah. I, I know like coming from an old school place, I feel like there's a, you know, there's a better or worse, but it's not, it's, it's baseball and football, right? I mean, mm -hmm. you use a stick to move the ball. What kind of game is that? Right. You know, I mean, it's just two different games. So that I I really noticed, and so that character, that player rather, that player has lost three characters in our campaign, while the two old grognards are still on their original characters. You know, they've been they're up in third level or something like that, and and this guy's just like one character after another. He goes through them like like tissues, right? So that that would be I would find the big the big difference. Now, what that has to do with kids kids? adults i don't know i i think there's a greater appeal for kids in in 5e because um it's more wish fulfillment right hmm. like i mean harry potter is popular because every kid wants to be deeply misunderstood by the people who are raising them and secretly the most important person in the world sure you know sure. star wars you know Orphan kid on a backwater planet doing nothing, going nowhere, but he's secretly the key to everything. Everyone wants to think that that's them, right? That's wish fulfillment. That's why those stories are popular. Um, that's why I think 5e provides that. Like, you are astonishing. You can kill four blue dragons, you know, in two rounds of combat. And and I think I think there is a certain thing with that wishful fulfillment thing for, with kids. So, hmm. um, but, uh, that said though, they, they, they are fine playing the old school. You've gone to a Lumix webscan I, software. I am having some technical difficulty. Oh, it's just me now. It's just me. Am I actually alone on someone else's stream? That's fabulous. Well, I want to let you know that young, uh, he is, um, he has instructed me to tell you that you must subscribe to his channel because if he doesn't hit 500, I'm going to come to your house and personally deal with you. It will not be pretty. You're going to get a full dungeon minister treatment. I don't know where he's going. He's in the comments. I'm taking control. Welcome to the dungeon minister. All right, so it's been a while since we've heard from the Heroes of Honeywood. Uh, we have been playing. I just haven't been uh, making videos because I was doing the uh, the Poison Well series. Where's St. Beckme? I don't have St. Beckme here with me. If you don't watch my channel, you have no idea what that means. I'll take advantage this time to show you some of the wonderful things on my desk. This was made by um, Lawrence over at Dirty Basement Terrain, another channel you should subscribe to. Isn't that horrific? Isn't he fun? The great thing about this mini is that... Uh, the boys see it on my desk and they're worried about when they might have to fight it. They know I have it. And so I think they watch it to see if it moves. And if it moves too much, then they get nervous. So every once in a while, I just like to move it. So they think I've picked it up and I'm designing an adventure around it. Um, let's see. Oh, you know what I can do? 
I can show you what my brother-in-law got me for Christmas. Oof. He 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 does great toys. I I don't quite know where I'm going to put this. And Fleetwood desperately wants me to open it so he can play with it. But um, and he gave Fleetwood. I think it may have been his from back in the day. So he didn't write his name in it. So if he loaned it to any of his friends in high school, uh, they could have just taken it. But apparently he didn't. That is awesome. And I also got a, um, where did I put them? Oh, they're buried somewhere over here. A stack of uh, Dragon magazines and White Wolf magazines. And I should find it because it's very peculiar. I've never seen it before. Let's see if I can dig it out. I cleared off my desk to do this today, so I don't I don't exactly know where I put it. Oh, no, I put it in here. That's where I put it. This thing is really cool. From Bard Games. The complete, and I like the spelling there because that's your less usual spelling for complete. The com adventurer. Oh, hello. Sorry about it. I don't know what Hello, happened. Yang. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh... <laughs> Everyone, this is uh, Yang Yang Zhao. He's uh, hello uh, YouTuber. He uh, oh, never mind. Sorry, I've just been showing off toys while you were fixing your mic. Your um, nice. Camera. Uh, yeah, I don't know what happened. Everything just uh, died on me there. <laughs> um. Oh, so I wanted to ask one thing. I've always mm -hmm. wanted to know, as a real life cleric, uh, do you ever feel like a sense of Envy or perhaps ennui that um, you can't use edged weapons. Uh, no, not really. There's there's very few people I actually want to cut open, but a few that I do oh, want to okay. bludgeon to death. No, I don't. You know, actually, when I was um, when I was a kid playing D and D, I worked at a Renaissance festival, oh. and this was this was in the eighties. Yeah, again, eight, late eighties, early nineties, back before renaissance festivals became a little um <laughs> and um there was a weapons shop i worked at a leather booth selling leather goods oh, mostly nice. purses and stuff like that but um pouches and you know there's a weapons booth across the way and they had the coolest swords but they had a mace a high gothic flanged mace that i wanted so bad um and i was nowhere near being a cleric at the time uh, I was an atheist, so I wouldn't have thought to become a cleric, but but I wanted that mace. And now I'm thinking that's why I was drawn to it. This is my weapon of choice. Uh, it was God calling you to God calling me through the through the braining of other people. That's right. Um, Maybe not. <laughs> so uh, then uh, what would be your bludgeoning weapon of choice? Would it be the mace or it, it would, would be you, the mace? Yeah, not not yeah. Uh, something a little more Canadian, like a hockey stick or. <laughs> You could go no, Asian style I, and do like a slipper or or it's cold now, so maybe a boot. No, uh, when when I when I was coming up to uh, to Canada, I was in I, I I'm from Milwaukee or I'm from Wisconsin originally, and I was living in Milwaukee um, before I came up here. And when it was announced I was coming up here, the the parish I was going to is the cathedral, actually All Saints Cathedral in Milwaukee. They threw a party for me to send me off, you know, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they <laughs> father talmage i'll never forget father talmage gave me a hockey stick with maple leaves stuck to it and he called <laughs> it a canadian crozier you know the the thing a bishop <laughs> uses the crozier um no when when i play i almost always if i play a cleric and i don't i don't play a lot but when i do and i play a cleric i always have a warhammer but in real life i would want a mace because you wouldn't have to worry about which surface you're using right like if you saw if you hit someone with the side of a hammer, it's not going to do as much damage. But a mace doesn't have a front or back, and so I'm being not terribly coordinated myself. Um, I would want something that it wouldn't matter which which side I hit with. Hmm. Yeah. Interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm peeking at the I'm peeking at the um, at the comments as well. Uh, um, so one of the one of the real reasons that I wanted to have you here is. Mm. Um, I have a small series of videos on the channel called religion and D&D &D sucks and how to fix them. And which I should um, have watched before coming on, but I didn't. Uh, they're not that great. 
but everyone else should watch them. They're great for everyone else. Um, so one of my questions is, as uh, uh, an actual man of the cloth, um, for someone who religion plays an important part of your life, mm-hmm. how do you feel that religion is treated, um, you know, specifically in, in various versions of D&D, but also right. in other tabletop role-playing games? Um, well, I can't speak to many other tabletop role playing mm-hmm. games. I have to tell you, I, I don't have a, a breadth of of experience on this. I recently, I was playing Gamble World with James Keck, um, but now we are using um, his Simple Sixes system for a very Gamble World like setting. The, the the Simple Sixes is really flexible, so you can use it for any kind of setting setting agnostic and you can apply it to almost anything actually fleetwood ran a world war ii adventure using it um oh, cool so i've got those under my belt um i've played call of cthulhu once and i really want to play it again um i did uh i did uh, gm some um what do they call it narrator um vampire at the beginning of oh. university which is i mean the freshman in university that's when you should play vampire right you know it's all very dark and very serious um that one i actually interestingly that game was made as i later found out by the son of a clergyman oh and it was a morality explore an exploration of morality i think the the son had had abandoned faith but it was his attempt to wrestle with some of the same issues of of morality of immortality of um you know consequences of actions of of who we are and what we are and why we are because I mean, the vampire has to be asking themselves these questions right um uh anchorite's cat yeah first year university that's that's when you play vampire um a vampire has got to ask those questions, right? Because like, wh- why did mm-hmm. I, why this curse? Um, who am I now that I, I can't really connect with human, with the humanity I used to have that's still in me, but I, I can't connect with it anymore. I can't be part of the world. I'm an outcast, but now I'm included in this other world that is so dark and sinister. And, and that really, that kind of Cain able, right? Because the whole idea is the children of Cain, right? That's the yep. beginning of the vampire thing. So, that i think deals with all of those questions that are really but it doesn't do it in a religious way so you're asking about religion as portrayed in the games mm-hmm. and of course the system that I, i'm most familiar with back me frank menser lays out pretty early on don't bring real world religions into it sure which in a multicultural you know world which in the 80s the us was much less so but it was oh, yeah. becoming right um is probably wise and a part of that is like let's say you've got two clerics in the in the party and one of them is playing as essentially a, a, a christian cleric and the other one is, is playing as a, a, a hindu cleric and they go to cast their spells and one of them rolls well and the other one rolls badly what does that mean <laughs> you know you're introducing yeah, all yeah, sorts yeah, of yeah, yeah. you're you're gamifying something that shouldn't be a game right and also yeah. making um making transactional something that is inherently not people yeah. think of prayer and both both people of no faith and, and people of faith make the mistake of thinking of prayer as transactional well, god i'll pray to you and you'll do this i'll put it in the quarter and you'll spit out the cheetos right um which is just not what prayer is um but uh any more than your relationship with your wife is a transaction i mean you don't want to tell your wife that you regard your relationship as a transaction because that goes nowhere good, no, right? No, no, no. <laughs> so, that, so it's DM tip of the day. Do yeah. not say that to your wife. Um, so in that sense, I, 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 I really get where he's coming from, but a lot of times people who are playing clerics, they want to, they want to know what they're about. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and so if you are going to import some religious system, um, I mean, there's gobs of them out there in pre-made stuff, but I think if you're going to make your own for your world, uh, it is what, what I've, what I've done in our homebrew game is keep it as vague as possible. Partly we don't have any mm-hmm. clerics in the party. 
um, which every time they get badly wounded is something that they notice the lack of. Um, but so we don't have to deal with it head on. Um, and, and, and actually, I've been thinking about this recently, uh, how little time they spend around civilization. By nature, right? I mean, you, the adventures tend to be off in the wilderness. But that the um, if you homebrew a religious system, I think it is it is really important to make sure there are um, that there are festivals, that there's a regular way that the people worship Mm -hmm. that you invent and that and that there are special times of year that that punctuate the season where things happen if you're trying to make something that's immersive and realistic um to like pretty much every religion has some event around harvest yeah there's something that happens around the harvest and generally there's something that happens around the planting and because most most not all but most role playing happens in a fantasy world and that's the one that i'm most familiar with and it's a medieval sort of fantasy or low low um, technology fantasy world, whether it's European, Asian, whatever. But um, planting and harvesting are going to be huge events in the life of the community. And it's going to be something that everyone either participates in or witnesses close up. So there should be religious events around those things. And there should be religious event events around the shortest and longest days of the year, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um if you have a if you have a pantheon of gods, you decide what events in the lives of those gods, in the stories of those gods, and then you have you know festivals around those. I mean, Christmas is the festival of the birth of Jesus. So there's one part of the narrative part of the story of Jesus' is birth. So we'll feast there, right? Um, and I was actually thinking about this uh, when I saw the when I saw the description of of of, of the topic, and I thought, okay, cool. Um, there are a lot of minor festivals in the lives of real world faiths mm -hmm. that you could lift and put into your game, and no one would have the foggiest idea, unless they're big old church nerds. No one would have the foggiest idea that that comes from somewhere. Um, an example, probably one of the more famous ones, but still one that. Almost nobody, um, almost nobody knows about is Candlemas on the second of February, which typically gets celebrated as Groundhog's Day. In the mm. church, is known as Candlemas or the presentation of, of Jesus in the temple. At forty days after a birth, the mother goes for purification, and the firstborn male child is presented at the temple and then bought back because all the firstborn males belong to God, and so there's a redemption that happens um and part of the story is this is this old man who takes the christ child in his arms and says um now let your servant depart in peace for my eyes have seen the salvation of the world that the light to lighten the nations and just that line a light to enlighten the nations the church said aha we will bless candles that day and so the candles for the the, the rest of the year were blessed on that day and candles were given to people to take home. Um, so you could take something like that. So it almost nobody knows about this feast. It's hardly practiced anymore. And you could have in your in your you know your your in world religion, they you know, in the darkest time of the year, they bless candles, and everyone takes a candle home. And maybe there's some long procession with candles, right? Um, so you could take something that really exists if you're not. If you're not good at coming up with the stuff on your own, you can take the things that actually exist or pull elements out of them and use them for for this sort of deep realism in the game because it's entirely believable because it actually happens. You know, St. Blaze's yeah. Day, people, the blessing of throats on St. Blaze's Day. <laughs> you know, the blessing of throats. What a weird thing, but that's a actual practice on an actual feast day. And you could you could you could use elements like that. I, I would say you'd if you're using real world religions, you want to use it respectfully. Mm -hmm. You don't turn you don't turn some you know uh, minor Hindu practice into some sort of death cult because that's just really kind of insulting. You don't turn you don't turn Candlemas into you know, you know the sacrifice of virgins or something. Yeah, yeah, that's... yeah. But uh, but it, it has it has all these these layers and all this symbolism already worked into it that the lazy DM does not have to sit there 
racking his or her brains trying to come up with something, right? Yeah. Interesting you mentioned that. I have a video coming up next Monday on creating holidays cool. in your fictional world. Um, cool. You know, one of the problems I have with uh, religion, either as portrayed in in a lot of role playing games, but D and D specifically, and I'm not 100 percent sure whether it's uh, the systems themselves or just the people who play them these days, but they, um, you know, the clerics and paladins and even monks, they, they talk about their religion sort right. of like they would tell people, you know, they're in a Tuesday night bowling league. Like it doesn't <laughs> seem, yes. yeah. uh, you know, for them and the people in the world, uh, it's just like, uh, you know, something I do, I don't know, whatever. Uh, whereas, you know, throughout history, religion has been a motivation for um, not only wars, but it's also been for, uh, you know, the movement towards mass education, um, various uh, healthcare initiatives, you know, having yeah. hospitals and whatnot. Uh, there were the yeah. hospitaler nights. Um, so, yeah. well, like, and, and to like me, the, that's, the modern, that's, the, mm -hmm. the modern hospital comes out of the, the monastic, you know, communities yeah. who'd have, all these beds set up for people who were sick and people who knew about herbs and could read and write Latin. So they could, they could communicate about how diseases were treated and what they did. And yeah. Anyway, sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, Cause no, that's what it's... I do. I'm an only child. I don't care. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I mean, it, it, that's the kind of point, uh, the kind of thing that disappoints me yeah. in how religion is often represented in the games. And, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit before the show, like, I'm I'm kind of wondering too if it's because I'm playing it now, you know, and when Gary made the game 50 years ago this year. Yeah. Um year of things the were very different. You know, the the majority of people in North America were still going to church on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, religion played a much it, it, the other thing too is um you know, no man is an island and often things that we would consider organized and, and whatnot through government bodies today it was mostly through like churches and you know yeah. local community organizations like that so it seems to me that this is something that's kind of missing from the play and missing like from the villagers like mm -hmm. there's a temple but it's never like you know nobody's ever in there when, when's yeah. the when's their busy day you know that, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah that's true that's absolutely true and it it, it becomes um yeah, it becomes like, um, yeah, you're you're right. Like, like I belong to a Tuesday um, pickleball club kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's not a part. So it, I think if you're going to have, um, and this, I mean, I will say this is one place where Beckme really falls down because I think they were trying to get understanding. It was happening. It was it was released in the you know during the the the, the, the satanic panic and everything else, attempting yeah. to distance themselves from any actual contact with religion um it was downplayed so much that one does wonder what what the cleric is 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 on about like why why is the cleric concerned about these things what is the paladin the paladin has given himself for this and like what just to be good i mean that's you don't get fired up just to be good yeah right exactly. there's got to be something behind it um there's a there's a reason for the kind of intensity that a that a paladin would have to have um yeah and i think it it would be interesting to to construct a game and a, and a and a campaign in which um especially if you have those characters that are more you know explicitly religious that that their every action should be seen through that filter Right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas the fighter, maybe the fighter, and, and I think it's absolutely true that that plenty of people throughout history, even in more overtly religious times, um, plenty of people didn't push everything through that filter, um, as as witnessed by all the atrocities that people have committed. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, it's like, um, but I think it if you have if you have a cleric, if you've got a paladin, they they would they would want to 
put that filter in front of everything they they encounter and do. So the 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 player at the table who's obnoxious because he's always talking about how no my paladin won't do that. I can't do that. I you know that's actually right, right? Because if yeah. someone's going to strap on that armor and be that intense of a warrior for their god, they've got to be taking it seriously. You can't do that just as a whim, as a lark, right? Um, yeah. And what what could that? How would that pan out? So, like, you know, when um, when you go to when you when you go to the temple. Have you shown up in the middle of of a uh, of their busy time? If you've shown up in the middle of a liturgy, you mm -hmm. know because this is not a god you worship, so you don't know what day they do their thing on, and and you stumble into the middle of it, and you make an ass of yourself in front of the whole town because they are all there and they all turn around, right? You you barge in and as you're all covered in you. blood and yeah, seeking a few goblin scalps, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you you're here to get healed because one of your your party has you know the mummy attacked and they've got tomb rot, right? And, <laughs> They're all full of pustules and, and pus and ooze and <laughs> and need a healing. You know, I'm sorry. The clerics are busy till at least one o'clock. <laughs> Come back, you know. Um, but also, also you go into a town and it's clearly a festive season or it's clearly mm -hmm. a fasting season. Um, you go into a town and and they're in the middle of a of of uh, a religious observance of some kind, which is going to alter how you interact with that town. You're not going to be able to um to buy your weapons you're not going to be able to uh find a room because there's no room at the end you know everyone's in town for the festival um simple things like that and also just the sort of feeling in the air it, it would be a good way to get some great sort of um atmosphere going you mm -hmm. know without a heck of a lot of work to to say you know it's 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 this world's version of lent yeah you know everyone's sure. in, in sackcloth <laughs> yeah and and it's a reason to have like excess of goods and uh a, a um, lack of goods yep. and then you know it could be like every religion's got some sort of gift giving season gift giving yep. holiday so yep. you know maybe uh maybe it's time you're you're you know you if as a dm you gave your people too many too much gold uh maybe uh it's time for them to give a bunch of gifts to all the citizens yep. all their friends mm -hmm. and the kings and whoever sponsors them and and definitely the town guard because you never know when that's going to come back and help you out you want to have that or or is this this is the season when um you know the the local temple takes its tithe mm -hmm. and um you don't want to be on the wrong side of you don't want to be on the wrong side of the local cleric who just healed you of tomb rot, do you? You know, definitely. Um, so yeah, that is that is true. Um, and have you noticed? Uh, well, I don't know. Being that you're a cleric yourself and not mm -hmm. uh, you're not like in disguise or anything, have you noticed uh, players or maybe at the game shop? Um, mm -hmm. Are they? Have you noticed anyone who's sort of religion averse? And one reason I asked this is um, I started playing in. Uh, in a campaign about six, seven years ago. And I was playing a monk. Um, and as part of it, he was handing out religious pamphlets uh, in every city that he went to. <laughs> um, and like when I first started doing it, uh, the other players, like, you know, they're, you could feel their sphincters tighten up <laughs> as if I was actually going right. to start talking to them about Jesus, uh, as opposed right. to this, you know, fictional deity. Uh, have you noticed any sort of resistance? Um, you know what? Not a lot. I've got once or twice, and I actually am surprised, given that it is, you know, the internet. I am surprised how few negative comments I've had on my channel of people attacking me because I, I have the collar mm -hmm. on. I, I a couple of people who, you know, I mean, just full out, troll level you know you know we'll go rape a child you know kind of comments mm. like you know wow uh really um uh but mostly um positive i will say it was kind of funny it was a minor thing it was during the pandemic is when I, we started playing and so i needed to get the boys some dice and so i went online and i i ordered them from the hooded goblin from the, the game shop and at that time, they would mail it to you. But to save money, I just 
you could pick it up at the store, right? Mm -hmm. So I ordered it for pickup. And I'm at work, right? And we couldn't do much because we couldn't go visiting people, couldn't go to the hospital, couldn't go to nursing homes, etc. But I, I, I always wear the uniform, as it were. Uh, I'm always in clericals. So I stopped by, uh, you know, uh, between doing other things. And um, they had a sign outside, you know, ring the bell uh, for pickups. And so I rang the bell and you could see them inside. They could plate glass window. They could see me. They looked. Then they went right back to what they were doing. Like he's handing out tracts or something. or He's going to invite us to, you know, to the the, the local prayer meeting. I'm not going to, you know, and, and so I rang it again and they looked. And eventually someone slowly got out from behind the counter like this guy is in the wrong place. And he comes, I'm like, uh, I've got a, I've got a order. Uh, it's my name. And, and yeah, I ordered some dice. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> then, you know, they went, um, but other than other, I mean, that wasn't even a negative. It was just a confusion. Like, why is he here? But, um, since then I've been in so many times and they're all, the, they, they know me and, um, and actually it's just the reverse. Hmm. I'll go in and there's guys playing, you know, crisis protocol or the star Wars one with the little ships or whatever, whatever it is. Um, and occasionally someone will like, you know, but generally speaking, it's, Oh, hello, Padre. Hello, father, you know, it, Hey, Reverend, how are you doing? And so, so far from negative, um, it has actually, uh, and, and, and I will be candid enough to admit that there was, a, this was in the back of my mind when I started the channel. People who would never darken the door of a church, um, people who don't want anything to do with organized religion, but they don't have to go where I live. I've come to where they live, you mm -hmm. know, D and D in the online space. And they want to talk. Someone wants to talk. It's not anyone else I can talk to. They're not about to go to a local church. And I'll get a message on social media or an email or something. And someone's reaching out with, in some level of crisis, some level of difficulty and say, hey, can, can, can I ask you something? You know, so actually the response has been um, overwhelmingly positive. And, and even to the point where it, it, it has become a piece of ministry for me. Um, and it's just the act of going where people already are, you know, um, and uh, yeah. And, and going there, you know, carrying the flag though, you know, wearing the collar. So it's, it's obvious who I am, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm on safe ground. Cause I'm, I'm in the D and D space. I'm in the role-playing game space. You don't have to go to the church to talk to me kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you know, and it's interesting you you say that because that is also sort of one of my problems with how religions in D&D are often played. If you look at popular media, yeah. at least for the last 20 years, if not 40, um, when you see uh, a priest or other clergy in movies, except for maybe Buddhists who are always portrayed as wise, uh, <laughs> but the other religions, um, <laughs> you know, they, they're not very flattering portrayals um they're no. doing things that they shouldn't or they're seen as like very aloof and not really caring about their their uh the members of their their parishes or their flock or however you want to say it um and it but that's not I, i'm sure those people exist but oh, yeah you know in in real life now and especially in the past a lot of uh, clergy work was going out and talking to people and meeting people. And it was not unusual to see priests hanging out, doing things um, to some extent, nuns, you, you know, mm -hmm. you used to see them around all the time. Um, you know, speaking of Tuesday night bowling leagues, uh, I was in one as a kid and there were, were uh, a couple of priests who, who enjoyed bowling. Yeah. So, um, you know, to me too, is, you know, if you want to spice your game up, you know, why, why doesn't the, the local cleric hang out at the tavern or, yeah. you know, maybe, maybe he has a farm too, hmm. you know, a lot of, yeah. it just seems like, you know, the, they're always sort of separated and off and they're kind of weird a little bit, <laughs> you know, as opposed to like yeah. integrated in society, I'm all yeah. for like secret cults and stuff, but 
It shouldn't be all the religions. Oh, oh so am I. And, and, and Anglicanism is increasingly becoming one. <laughs> but no, the, the reality, like, you know, the, the, the media portrayal, because it's more interesting, because there's a there's a there's a there's a betrayal involved. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the media portrayal of, a, of a, a religious person who is horrible is more interesting because of what they're supposed sure. to be. Right. Right. But the reality is, I mean, people aren't going into this for the money. I can tell you that for from firsthand experience. Right. It's not like, you know, well, yeah, all yeah. the all the all the money and power. I'll go into the church. That's where it's at. You know, Um <laughs> if there was ever money and power in being a priest, it that ain't today. <laughs> so if you're seeing a priest, they're probably not doing it for the money or the power. Um, or if they are, they were sadly mistaken. Um, uh, and yeah, the, 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 the involvement in, in the world. Um, uh, and I can only speak from the Christian perspective, of course, but to, to be in the world, but not of it should be part of, of, of the idea, because if you if you if you're talking about a religion that is integrated into, um, if you're talking about a religion that is integrated into the world that you've made, then uh, then the the whole world is the the whole world is the mission field. The entire world is where that that religion plays out, mm -hmm. and so it makes sense that it has been constructed along the lines and the tenets of that religion and, or at least in, infused and informed by them and that the people would show up. And like the, the priest doesn't just go back in a box at the end of the service, you know, to, to emerge next Sunday, right? They, they live the rest of the week and you'll see them around. <laughs> it's probably actually part of the reason I do wear the collar all the time because it, it just, raises a little flag like we're still here you know <laughs> um yeah and you know uh, even even like you know on a on a not uh specifically religious point in a world building if you do want to have those secret societies and like mm -hmm. mystery religions and whatnot you need a base you need to have like what's a normal religion first and right. what people think of and then you can contrast it with whatever weird stuff uh this this cult is into yeah this is this is what a this is what a twisted religion looks like and this yeah, is what it, yeah, it, exactly. it, it 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 functions like unless maybe the twisted culty stuff is the normal and then the mystery religion the sort of underground religion is the one that's just like hey let's be cool to each other <laughs> you know <laughs> let's let's do some sex self-sacrificial love and uh you know th and that becomes the the ooh, secret one you know yeah. Um, and so I think the, my, my last big question is, um, everyone's favorite possession. Uh, how, how do you think, uh, in games that, uh, that, uh, like sort of the, the more exotic priestly duties, are are portrayed like in a good way or in a bad way in terms of like you have people being possessed or perhaps haunted by ghosts or something right. um do you think it's like too far off or it's about right or yeah you know you you would have more insight into perhaps the realities of how some of these things work um clearly we don't want to scare the bejesus out of everyone uh <laughs> in real life but like well maybe you it... don't <laughs> <laughs> like well, uh yeah, well, I mean, if you wanted to talk about like, the reality of 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 exorcists, for instance, I mean, mm -hmm. um, the number of dioceses that have an a, you know a, a, an exorcist is vanishingly small, and generally speaking, it's a parish priest who's just agreed to do a little special training, and oh yeah, I'll, I'll and ninety nine point nine percent of the calls are things like. Um, no, what this is is a psychosis. Um, this person needs mental health, mental health treatment. They need to see, you know, it's not. Um, so it's it's overwhelmingly a, a terribly drab job. So it really wouldn't scare anybody. But set that in a fantasy setting and all bets are off. Um, I think it I, I think it can be as as out there as it wants to be i think it, mm -hmm. it's fabulous if it if you because if you're if you're dealing in a fantasy setting if you're dealing with clerics whose prayers 
you know, in some sense are transactional because that by in a game, it has to be right. You have to, you have to roll some dice about something. Um, if you're dealing with, with, with clerics who can touch someone and, and their wounds vanish from the surface of their skin. Right. And, and, and they can, um, you know, purify food and water and they can uh, raise the dead and they can turn the undead and, and all these things. And there are undead walking around. I mean, um, if, you, if you're dealing with that, you you really can't go too far with your with the vividness of your religious experiences, mm-hmm. right? I think you, you can you can really pull out all the stops on that stuff. Um, it's it's always to me, and I'm, I'm and the Anglican Church is it, it, it is a sacramental. Um, uh, faith and so they're there what that means is that there's there's stuff involved right there's actual bread and actual wine there's actual water there's actual oil right used in some of the 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 rituals the sacraments that 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 we do and so i always love when there's stuff right that 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 gets involved and it it, it gets um tangible touchable things and, and that I think game wise is fabulous because it, there's the potential there for, for this ceremony, we need quest item, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But on top of that, there's the, the sense of, of a touchable material involvement, because again, if your religion says that these gods created the world or, you know, we're, you know, we're formed from it by some, you know, higher power than the, the sort of mid-level gods or whatever you do, there's a connection then between the, 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 the divine world, the, the mystical world and the physical world in it. And that that's where the interesting bits happen, right. In that intersection. Um, so, yeah, I think it, when you're, you're dealing with ritual, you're dealing with, um, with any of those things, the more, again, it's a fantasy setting. So the more wild you can make it, the mm-hmm. more out there you can make it like, why not? Right. I mean, you, you've got you've got dragons flying around in the sky. You've got <laughs> this floating ball with a huge eye and mouth and eye stalks coming out of it. Like, how what are you going to? Oh, that's just too weird. We can't believe that. <laughs> you know, do what you want. Right. Uh, um, do you think some things are too easy? Like, for example, if someone is cursed, you know, usually there's uh, like if you look at biblical readings like there's usually some sort of atonement that they have to do and praying and stuff do you think that it's too easy that the cleric just goes okay remove curse spell boop or do you think like you know as a dm would you sort of make someone drag that out more and make them you know they could use the spell it would be effective but they have to sort of like do other things as a component of that or well there's an advantage to not having a cleric in the party um is that when when they need some level of healing beyond cure light wounds you know, mm-hmm. ocean of healing kind of thing. When they need something, you can have them go to a cleric and there can be a quest attached to it. You will do this. I will do this for you. You will do this for me. So you're going to have to earn this. It will require some, and, and, and not just in a way of payment, but in a sense, um, so I will, you know, I will remove the curse you are then going to go and remove an evil from a, a sacred site because a sacred site has been befouled by some, you know, some evil presence. So I will remove the evil from you. You will go and remove the evil from this place. You know, you have the weapons and the brawn and can do that. I have the divine magic and I can do this. And so your action will be participant in mine and we will we'll both accomplish the removal of evil and the cleansing, you know, in my case, I will cleanse you. In your case, you will cleanse our temple or our shrine or whatever. Um, so there, there's an advantage of not having a cleric in the party because you don't just get, well, tomorrow I'll just pray for that spell. Bing. Um, with the cleric in the party, maybe, maybe, and you, you know, you've got to, you've got to massage the rules depending on the system, right? Yeah. Maybe mm-hmm. it isn't, it isn't, you just can remove the curse. Maybe you have to, there has to be some proving, right? You know, some sort of almost shamanistic. You're going to have to go into yep. the wilderness and face the 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 demon that's cursing you, um, and then with the cleric's 
power and your own efforts, your own struggling, then it will be removed and revoked. And, uh, you know, there'd be an interesting way to, 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 to deepen those spells, but it would require buy-in from the player to say, I'm going to play a cleric that I'm not going to get the sort of auto spells. The magic user over there is just shooting spells like crazy, right? Whereas I'm going to have to do things for mine, right? Yeah. In my campaigns, when I DM them, I, I usually do that and um, like revive dead uh, and spells like that. Uh, I make them like, no, 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 you don't automatically get that. You have to go do a quest right. for your God specifically to have this ability, you know, to prove your faith type of yeah, thing. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can take you can take you're the dungeon master. You can take certain spells and put them behind a fence. Yeah, pick, definitely. On, on this list, pick, you know, these these six go crazy but these ones those are going to take special special doing yeah that, that sounds perfectly reasonable right like why mm -hmm. not and and it i think it makes it more interesting i think it's actually in a sense more rewarding for the cleric you don't get the easy you don't get the easy you know do the job but you you get mm -hmm. far more it involves your character. It actually involves your character rather than your sheet of paper, right? It, yeah. It involves your, your, you're actually playing through and working through something rather than just it's written down so I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think ultimately, um, if you're looking at people who are, who are into a long-term campaign, something like that, um, feels more earned and, you know, whether you're paying Beck me or one E or even five E, uh, I think that players, you know, appreciate having earned something as opposed to just, it's just handed to you. Yeah. 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 When the things come too easy, it's like, well, okay. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, well, I don't, I don't want that. I, I want to, I just want to keep slogging it out here. Yeah. I, I love, I, I've, one of the things I found is I really like low level play. Mm -hmm. I really like low level play when I'm the player. Because I I, I want to slog for a while. I want it to be hard. Because it would be yeah. it would be impossible for me personally. So it should be hard for my character, you know, being a idealized version of myself. Yeah, definitely. Um, and and I've read some uh, marketing on like different five E campaigns, and it's usually the lower level campaigns that people like the most. You know, most don't even go much farther past ten. Uh, they become very hard to DM from what I understand. Yeah. It's like, how do I challenge? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> part, part of it is just the power curve. Um, mm. Like once you're level 20, you are basically either a God yourself or yeah. a demigod. So, you know, it, well, 20 it, it is the new 36. 20, 20 is right. the new 36. So, yeah, that's right. Um, well, I want to thank you for coming by. Thanks for I having me. You're, you're busy season, so you're probably ready to take off and hibernate for I, I've another got a, couple I've months got to, until Easter. <laughs> I've got to go stuff three children into bed, so oh, um, that's when I got to convince them that it is actually time to go to bed. <laughs> yeah, we're about when they normally hit the hay. So, all right. Well, yeah. good luck with that. Um, Thank you. Thanks everyone for coming by. Uh, if you could click like, I could see that there are twenty of you here, but there are not twenty likes on the video. So. Uh, please, um, click like, uh, subscribe tomorrow, 8 PM. I have the lady, Ali Sanguis. Uh, we're going to talk about world building. Uh, she is an author, both of books with pictures and books without pictures. So we're going to talk about world building, uh, if there's any difference and, uh, she's a big horror fan. So we'll talk about how to create good horror in your in your made up worlds. Cool. So thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Dungeon Minister. And uh, I will see you guys soon. Thanks, man.